I would probably say, you know, um, these are going to be talking about like, these are like real crimes. Like, I would imagine that there is probably, it, this is probably going to be triggering to some people. I would assume that this is going to be triggering for sure. These are real cases. Uh, real, this is real. These are real people and real crime that has happened. So just be aware. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Last one. Actual last one. Okay, one more, one more, one more. On the afternoon of June 9, 2017, 26-year-old environmental sciences student Yingying Zheng was traveling on a bus to an off-campus apartment complex in Urbana, Illinois, where she Why was planning to sign channels? a new lease for an apartment. She was running late and sent a text message to the leasing agent to inform them that she would arrive just after 2 p.m. After riding on one bus, she exited and tried to transfer to another, yet mistakenly waited on the wrong side of a street for boarding and missed it. She walked to the next bus stop a few blocks away at the corner of North Goodwin Avenue, where surveillance showed that a black Saturn Astra passed her by at exactly 2 p.m. It then circled back around and stopped where she was waiting at 2.03 p.m. She spoke to the driver for approximately one minute and then got in the car before it drove away. <gasps> no. No. She trusted a stranger. The leasing agent sent her a text message at approximately 2.38, but received no reply. As the hours passed, Zheng's friends, aware of her errand and expecting her to return quickly, grew increasingly worried, and a missing persons report was filed to police at exactly 9.24 p.m. that night. The University of Illinois helped coordinate search efforts on and around campus. Yin Ying's family flew into the U.S., and a reward of $50,000 was offered for information leading to her whereabouts, but the local authorities received no leads. It was on the 12th of June, however, when the FBI discovered the surveillance footage capturing Yin Ying's last known location. They were unable to discern the license plate number of the vehicle from no. the footage, yet they were able to determine that there were 18 four-door Saturn Astras registered to owners in the state of Illinois. One of the owners was 27-year-old Brent Allen Christensen, a PhD student at the University of Illinois who had graduated with a master's degree in physics and who had been married for four years to his high school sweetheart, Michelle Zortman. Investigators interviewed him on June 12th and inspected his car. When questioned, he reportedly claimed that he did not remember what he was doing at the time of Yin Ying's disappearance, but also stated he was most likely sleeping or playing video games. The police took his contact information and he was released after just a nine-minute interview and a five-minute inspection of his vehicle. Two days later, upon reviewing the surveillance footage, investigators observed that the car's sunroof was similar to that of Christensen's, but more notably that the vehicle in the surveillance had a cracked hubcap, as did the vehicle <gasps> of Christensen, and who at that moment became the prime suspect. Oh he was called gosh. in by police in the late hours of Wednesday night, June 14th, requesting that he come in to discuss what they stated was an important matter regarding Yin Ying's disappearance. Christensen agreed, and an FBI investigator picked him up from his home and drove him to the Champaign Police Department at around 12 a.m. They got him. Wow. Thing up at the 24 hours. Yeah, and I assume you guys came at midnight that this is a priority, so I assume that it gets to go too fast. But yeah. Okay. Um. Um. Like I said, you're home. Um, my name is Anthony Manganero, especially with the FBI. I'm assigned here at Champagne. Yeah, Detective Eric Stuyverson. Detective with the uh, University of Police, okay. Um, we are investigating the disappearance of uh, Ms. Ying Ying. Um, because we are in my offices and it's late at night, I'm going to read you your advice of rights, okay. Um, again, this is a voluntary interview, so at any time you're done, we'll drive you back home. That's the end of it. Um, so I know that 
He spoke with my colleague Joel. Um, I've, I've briefly been able to talk to him. We've been kind of running all over the state. Um, so if you can kind of give me a, a, a recap of, of what you told him. No captions on this video, um, unfortunately. Our investigation, as I'm sure Joel probably told you, is the disappearance of this woman, uh, this young lady, and uh, the most viable tip that we had referred to a black uh, Saturn Astra. Um, so uh, that's why he came to talk to you the other day. Um, do you remember what you told him? And I'm not going to hold you to it if there are certain details yeah. you forget. Uh, so they came. The suspect had just been read his rights and essentially made aware that he is now a suspect, yet instead of confronting the situation and demanding why he is being put in such an uncomfortable position at such a late hour, he calmly accepts and responds in a non-adversarial manner. Imagine yourself in his position. You have nothing to do with this young woman's disappearance, yet you are being hassled and even accused by police in a passive yet blatant fashion. You would most likely demand to know exactly why you were being questioned in such a manner and exhibit some form of protest or objection at the current circumstances. They were just checking out all of the Saturn Astros in the area. Mm -hmm. I know it's a pretty rare car, so probably the short lists. Um, yeah. He asked where my wife and I were during, I think it was two or three on Friday. And I mean, I graduated a couple weeks ago, so I'm looking for jobs right now. So, okay. I mean, we I didn't was ask. either playing video games on my computer or taking an afternoon nap. So, I was unable to purchase an alloy. I looked into certain things to try and see if I could get some kind of info for an alibi. I sent some texts around that time, but none exactly between two and three. He stated that he was looking for texts that he may have sent during the time in question for the purpose of producing an alibi. Yet he was clearly unaware that police would later confirm that he was not playing video games at any point during the day in question either. Even when offline, digital forensics are able to uncover the exact time a game was played and how mm -hmm. long it was played for, which is far easier to determine on a computer than it is on a video game console like a PlayStation or Xbox. This wouldn't have completely refuted his alibi, as the suspect was smart enough to provide two possibilities. The narrative mm -hmm. that he could have been sleeping at the time would still have credibility. Um, I let them come in the apartments, they searched for stuff, I let them come in the car, they searched for stuff there. Um, that's pretty much it. Okay. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, get my info. Uh, what did you uh, graduate in? Uh, master's in physics. In physics? Yes. Well, that's way smarter than me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> His morale's high. I'm, not, I'm, I'm assuming that's over at the U of I there? Yes. Okay. Um, you said your wife was out of town. Um, yes. The guys mentioned something about Wisconsin. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. You guys are originally from there? Or is yes. That, okay. Um, do you know what day she was uh, in Wisconsin? Um like late Thursday night, early Friday morning until Sunday evening. You mentioned that you thought you possibly sent text messages between, you know, the hours of two or three, so you weren't able to find any. Um, That's correct. Do you, do you recall um, any text message they sent that day, or like, were there Oh, yeah, there were one. I, I actually left, well, I didn't, they didn't look through the phone, but I was showing them texts on my phone. Okay. Like, someone sent me a text at like 1.30, I responded at like 3.45 or something okay. like that, so um, there are texts around it. Yeah, but not, maybe not. Not exactly between specific. 2 and 3, and that's why I think I was probably lying down and sleeping, just because like, you know, especially now, I'll typically do stuff in the morning, look for jobs, apply to a few, mm -hmm. and like, you know, I'd like to sleep, yeah. wake up, respond. It, Definitely fits. That okay. So. Um, was that kind of pattern of kind of looking for jobs, um, kind of having a little relaxation after graduation, was that typical of the, the entire week prior? 
Looking for unfamiliar patterns in both the suspect and the missing person's behavior is routine procedure in a missing person's investigation. The question is posed to the suspect in a delusive manner, as anything he says at this point will not be taken at face value. Mm -hmm. The investigators will be relying solely on forensics and witness statements to determine any shifts in behavioral patterns during the week in question. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, do you remember specifically if you sent any applications out online or if you visited any places on uh, Friday, throughout the week? Um, throughout the week? Uh, I haven't had any in-person interviews. I had a phone interview on Thursday. And... Anything on Friday? Okay. Do you have any questions for me before... Um, um, why am I under suspicion? Is it just my car or is there anything else? Uh, I mean, that's, you know, a large portion. Uh, I mean, it is uh, a very unique car. Um, like I said, our search warrant is, uh, is just for the car. Yeah. So we can, yeah. you know, um, look into it. We can, of course, see what we can find. And of course, you could also turn around and exonerate you completely. I mean, I'm talking about okay. a very rare car. Yeah. So, the suspect cannot be detained at this moment and has just showed the first sign of contention. The first direct confrontation is yet to take place, and detectives will always plan for it to be initiated by them. For this reason, the lead investigator switches the suspect's focus to a less confrontational matter in order to put him at ease before the first confrontation begins. The detectives want to induce anxiety in the suspect, but it needs to be done at the right time to have the most advantageous effect. I feel like I have to listen so carefully because there's no subtitles. I love captions. Uh, how long were you at the U of I? Did you do undergrad there as well? No, I did my undergrad at UW Medicine. Okay. And I came here in 2013. Okay. I was initially in the PhD program, but I decided I didn't want a PhD, so I just kind of left with the master's. Got it. Um, I like the campus. It's all right. Not too bad. It's all right. Uh, do, you, do you meet your wife there? Or? No, we uh, actually grew up in the same hometown, didn't really know each other until end of high school. Mm -hmm. So we both moved to Madison when I went to undergrad and then moved here. Cool. Do you have any uh, questions, Eric? Yeah, the, uh, when we were talking about uh, Friday, uh, the day in question on the ninth, uh, yeah. the ninth can you remember, you, you said you played video games all day on Friday? Yeah, is it just between the time period that he's asking about or just literally all day? Literally all day. Um, at the moment, I'm not really hanging out with too many people or talking to too many people. Um, my wife mm. and the girl I talked to, um, she was busy, my wife was out of town, so it's like, well, I'm alone today. So, uh, yeah. It's just you didn't, you didn't go cruising campus or anything? I did on Saturday, but I mean, getting a little stir crazy, just decided to go for a drive yeah. on Saturday. But did you go out to eat or anything? Go any places? No, I didn't go out to eat. Whenever two investigators are conducting an interrogation, they will always decide which one of them will be initiating the confrontation beforehand. Experienced investigators are often familiar enough with non-verbal cues that even a slight pause or look will be enough to mm. signal the start of the encounter. Sick. Oh, there it was. He said it's time. You know that we didn't bring you all the way up here to talk about video games and what you had for lunch that day. Yep. Why do you think that we brought you up here? Because the car I own was seen picking up a girl that's missing. The confrontation is initiated in the form of a question, and a suspect is put on the spot. Instead of responding to the confrontation with a confrontation of his own, which is a common reaction for a truthful subject, he tries to give a justifiable reason as to why he is being questioned without acknowledging the severity of that same element. He's trying to avoid the confrontation. Predictable. Yeah. Yeah. So who was driving that car other than you on, on Friday night? Oh. <laughs> Friday the, the night. It's, it, you're driving your car on the night, weren't you? Does anybody else have access to that car? No one has access to that car. Okay. So how many sets of keys do we have in that car? Two. And where were they on the Friday? Uh, one. 
I would have had one, and my wife would have had one. And hers were in Wisconsin, right? Yeah. And what do you keep on that keychain? You keep both sets of keys, right? One for the Camaro, or do you have separate sets? Um, I have one keychain, but sometimes I take the Camaro keys off of it. So. Now, let's talk specifically about Friday. You went to school for how long at the U of I? Since 2013. Since 2013. Yeah, so since you're very familiar with our campus? Not really. I never really um, talked to anyone. So, so you're kind of a loner? Okay. But specifically on that day, okay, when you, you originally told the agents that came to your apartment that you just played video games all day long. You didn't leave the apartment. Yeah. But it's fair to say that we know that that's not true, correct? Why would I lie? I mean, <laughs> you know why. I think there's some misunderstanding why we're here. Because like I said, we're, we're, we're not just looking oh, for a God. needle in a haystack. I, I'm sorry, let me take that back. We are looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah. But my point is, you're, you're making it sound like we're just we're, we just randomly came across your vehicle of the 1400 Astros that are in the state of Illinois. I have so 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 what would have happened that day that brings us to you? Probably that I live in Champagne. The suspect once again refuses to acknowledge the severity of the confrontation and offers a justifiable reason as to why he is being questioned in such a manner. I mean, I've never seen one before, uh, an Astro. So Okay. No, well, believe me when I say that the full weight and force of the FBI. The up technique. It's you. time. And all that entails. Okay. Right now, my primary concern and why I've been out till midnight, and these guys have been out till midnight every single night, is we're trying to find this girl. It's raining outside, it's nasty. She's a foreign student, who's only been here for a few weeks. I wanna find her. I'm asking for help. I know, I, I mean. I've got her getting into your car. I need to know why. He didn't deny it. That's awkward. There's Brent, I need, I need to know why she's getting into your car and I need to know where she went. That's awkward. If we can help her, we need it done now because we need, we need to move on from this. It, it's been like six days now. I don't know what to say. Sorry. And you've been at the U of I for how long? Three years. Three. And that you know what we do I work in the Detectives Bureau at the U of I, and you know what we have access to? Cameras. Do you think that we're not going to track a vehicle all over campus? We control kiosks to bus stops. We can look in buses. We can look in every building out on the streets. And you're telling me that I didn't see you driving your car on Goodwin that I didn't see you driving down Wright Street and turning on right in front of a parking where everybody pays their tickets mm -hmm. and driving down University to Goodwin and heading south. And then you see her standing on that corner in that shade tree, didn't you? That's where you first saw her. And then you turned. You turned <laughs> He's so guilty. And we still have cameras. I've seen the videos, but I didn't see me. You've seen what we've allowed you to see. Can I see yeah. the stuff that you're talking about? Do you think that we brought you up here to show you video? We wanna, we wanna understand why you did it. Yeah. We wanna understand why you stopped there to pick her up. Was it to give her a ride? Are you afraid to tell us that you gave her a ride? Maybe you wanted to make a couple bucks as an Uber driver, and she told you I had to go get it. 
I had to go sign a lease at One North, and you're like, oh, I know where that's at. I'll drop you off. If you're afraid to tell us that you gave a ride someplace, we can work with you there. A familiar technique that has no official name but is widely recognized and routinely put into practice. The detective is essentially trying to get one foot in the door by aiming for a lower level of initial admittance. He is aware the suspect is unlikely to provide an outright confession, but more likely to at least acknowledge that he was driving the car that picked up the victim, and even more likely to do so when afforded an exit strategy. He is also given a justification as to why he has been reluctant to divulge this information up to this point. You will now see the suspect start to physically shake as his mind races back and forth as to whether to take the bait or not. But I know that you picked her up. I know you did. Oh my god, he's so I nervous. I saw you in your shirt. He's arms shaking. fully extended. Oh my god, he's shaking. Where did you drop her off at? She was looking for a ride. She had missed her bus. She told you she was going to one north, so where did you drop her off at? Oh my god, the fear. Okay. I thought I was around on Saturday. I did pick a girl up. I don't remember where. Okay. I saw her picture. I don't think it was her, though. Do you remember the girl's name that you picked up? No, she was talking very broken English. Tell us about what happened, what time of day was that? The fear. Early afternoon, I don't really remember. Okay. I was just driving around. Um, I saw a girl and she was very distressed. Okay. So I stopped. The, the foot's car through the door. I asked her if she needed help and talked to her for a little bit, how much. I gave her a short line of coat box. Okay. She freaked out and got out. Okay. That's all it was. Was this when you got on the north side of the railroad tracks on Goodwin, when you went across the university and you drove on north? And you let her out by the hospital or by the railroad tracks? Or where did you let her out at? I don't really remember specifics. Um, was it close to where you picked her up? Yeah, it was relatively close. It was in a residential area. Okay. So I'd never really been over there before. I had no reason to. Okay. When you say she freaked out, what did what did she do? Did she did she start throwing things at you? Did she scratch you? It looks like you have a scratch on your right bicep. There is that oh, from? I scratched myself. In my sleep. That's from. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. so she just freaked out. So she's sitting in the front passenger seat of your vehicle. Okay. Has oh. anybody else sat in that front passenger seat since she got out of the car? Probably. Um, okay. Not with me, but with my wife. Probably. I mean. So other than your wife, who, who else sat in the front passenger seat with you that you know? Um, maybe a guy she's hanging out with. Your wife? Yeah. Okay. Um, Beep. I don't know. I don't. Okay. okay. This was her. I, uh, and, well, and I if it's if it's her, her now again, okay. I want to find this girl because I know she's alone and scared out there, and we yeah. don't have any contact with her. So you said you picked her up. Yeah. You went a couple blocks away to a residential area. Do you remember if you went north? I went north for sure. Okay. I mean, I know my grandma tracks. Yeah. Same. Okay. So you went north. So that, that was relatively close to Loomis. So. All right. To to where? It was relatively close to Loomis. I'm so Loomis? familiar with that okay. area. And she said something like, "Turn left after a couple blocks." Um. Maybe she said something else because that's really when she started freaking out. car, get out, try to pull in the door, it's locked up, the car out of locks, mm -hmm. I'm locked, she got out, does it. Where were the streets at, do you remember? No, I don't remember. Do you remember where she was He's wearing? lying. No, I don't. What was her ethnicity? You said she had trouble speaking English. Well, well she, she was Asian. Asian. She was Asian. She was Asian, okay. Um, what was? What do you think? How old do you think she was? Was she, do you think she was a grad student, undergrad? Was she? Um, my guess was about twenty. 
Okay. I guess it was about 20. Um, she was 26. Her hair length-ish, kind of here. Um, uh, I have trouble telling Asian people apart from one another. Sorry. Well, you would remember no, this very specific, though, because when you pulled up to her, you rolled your window down, and she leaned into your car, so you were looking right at her face. And what yeah. did she have on her face? What did she have on her head? You were looking right at her. You would remember if you let a you stranger remember. into your car mm -hmm. like that. So I taught many, many semesters here, and a lot of the students were Asian. Okay. Was she wearing glasses? Did she have a ball cap on? The detectives continue to inquire over the missing person's appearance in the hopes that the suspect will give them an accurate response. If they can ascertain that the suspect's memory is clear enough to accurately recollect what clothing an individual was wearing at a particular time, it will enable them to cut through claims of a poor memory when inquiring into separate matters that occurred during that same time period. Mm. If the suspect is guilty, it would be in his best interest to continue to assert that he can't remember. He has already stated that she was Asian and had poor English, yet these general details are far easier to remember than particulars, mm -hmm. such as specific articles of clothing, which detectives are now trying to trap him with. She, she might have been wearing glasses, I don't remember that. So. What did she tell you whenever you rolled down the window and you were chatting with her? You said she looked distressed. Um, That's when I stopped. Do you remember specifically what yeah, uh, she said. said to you? Um, I asked her if something was wrong. Um, okay. Which would she say to that? Uh, she said, I'm late, I need to get somewhere or something like this. I was not exactly out of it, but just kind of like, oh, I'm going to help this random person, so I'm going to help this random person. Um, so she said she was running late for something? Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you're right, because again, I was just trying to get around. Mm -hmm. So. Did she say where she was trying to get to? Uh, you mentioned the, um, show me the phone. Uh, with the mask. She said she had a meeting with her professor. When I told her my name, she Listen. We can all pretend that you're care like worried about my well-being telling me to go to bed at 11.47 p.m. All right. We can pretend that. But we all know you guys are just projecting what you should be doing because you have to go to work in an hour. All right. We know that you're tired, but you can't stop watching. Okay. We know. All right. I've watched, like, how many hours? 15 hours of the criminal psychology. You think I don't know this? I know you got school in an hour or whatever. I know you have work and you stayed up all night watching, okay? Don't act like it's for my well-being. I, what I learned from this is that everyone is so selfish, okay? I know it's because you stayed up all night and you avoided your responsibilities, all right? You go to bed. You. <laughs> I'm totally joking, but I'm serious, kind of. I, I, I'm, I'm serious, but like, I was... I'm joking. I'm, I meant it, but like I meant it like in a, in, you know, like a. I'm joking, but I'm kind of serious, but I'm not, you know? Okay. <laughs> Say it again. Times. Her English was really bad. Um, this is the last video. I wasn't speaking properly either. Yeah, I mean, we really didn't talk about much. There really wasn't much said. Just, she looked freaked out. So, I got her right. So how, how long do you think that she was in your car for? Less than five minutes. Not less than <laughs> five minutes. Not long at all. There's just a few blocks and I apparently took a wrong turn compared to what she said and that was enough to spook her. So when you crossed the railroad tracks, did you turn to the left or to the right? I don't remember railroad tracks. So this is the last video. You said you kicked her out of the car in a residential neighborhood. She got out of the car, I think. Oh, she got out of the car? She wanted to get out. Like, that's why I let her out. Because okay, she was freaking out. Yeah. Okay. And she was saying things because, you didn't understand. Because you, uh, she, she thought you took a wrong turn. Yeah, and something, I don't know, something like that. So, 
Oh yeah. no. And she tried to open the door, but again it was locked because my car auto locks. Um, I was the one to get out. I'm not going to keep someone I barely know in my car who just want to be in there. You know, I don't know the girl. Um, Go be so up. That was the last I saw her. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, um, I would have told us earlier, but I mean, I thought it was Saturday. I guess. What does that have to do with anything? Whether it was Friday or Saturday. Marks pick up um, and drop off points. Again, I was driving around a decent amount beforehand. I don't remember exactly what I did beforehand. Yeah, we, so, you were definitely driving all over campus. And you were by yourself. And you weren't playing video games all day. So why would you tell us? Oh, that? yeah, why'd why you, you lie? Tell the FBI that comes to your house that I you were Saturday. I don't know. Oh, I see. You didn't mix up the days. I mean, I thought I was doing it Saturday. I see. So what did you think that those two agents were at your house talking to you about when they came over? Friday. That's why. I mean, Friday is a day? Or Friday, or they were there to ask you if you picked up an Asian female and gave her a ride? About Friday. I mean, they were asking me about Friday between 2 and 3. So I told them. Trips, thanks I mean, for joining. Maybe I got my days mixed up. You know, I said a little bit ago, I thought I was doing this Saturday. But you didn't bother to tell them, oh, I didn't, I played video games all day Friday, uh, uh, detective, but I actually did pick up a female on Saturday. You, you didn't feel the need to give them that information? And it might be important? I mean... The lead investigator makes the mistake of interrupting the suspect during a direct confrontation. He is understandably getting impatient and is at this moment more focused on gathering pretext for cross-examination at a later stage. All right, so you go no. northbound through university. Where do you go next? Do you remember? I turned left. So it looks like what I a rookie left. mistake. Um, Recounts driving route. I'm going to ask a route. personal route. question. Route. Don't take the wrong way. Is um, you, know, you, you mentioned your wife went on vacation with another friend. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's another guy she hangs out with. You mentioned there's another girl you hang out with. Do you guys have a we're no, we're very open relationship? relationship? Okay. Yeah, I have a girlfriend. She has a boyfriend as well. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so what? Yeah. It's in between us as well, in an unrelated way. Because it's not because of their own relationship, it's just a strain. So um, I, I, every marriage goes through some rough patches. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, how, how long has that been going on, that, that strain? The detectives are now building a foundation for the reframing technique. The fact the suspect has been going through a rocky marriage will now be afforded to him as a justification for the crimes he committed at a later stage. Ah. Eight months. Thanks, Jesse, Kiko, Arpit, and Mark. Thanks for joining. Yeah, I mean, I didn't tell her that I did this because I was scared that, I mean, well, right now, this is happening. Mm -hmm. Did she go to Wisconsin with a boy or another girlfriend? Guy. Did that, how'd that make you feel friend. when she went away for the weekend, this long weekend with that guy? No. And it's okay, those, that, those are normal human feelings. Yeah. Did you feel hurt? Well, yeah, but I mean, she's been seeing that for a while. Um, but still, she's your wife, and it's tough. You know, even if you're in an open mm -hmm. relationship like that, where it's tough to see somebody you care about, that you love, to go someplace else with somebody else and mm -hmm. not include you. Mm -hmm. And I get that, man. Is that why you were driving around campus all day, pretty much all day long on Friday? Because you missed her? Just trying to clear my head. Yeah, I'm lost. That's understandable. Yeah. And I was still crazy. I was. Hmm. Yeah, I thought it was Saturday. So. Did you talk to any other girls that day? No. Did you talk to any other girls on Saturday? Or did you stay home Saturday? No. Once again, days mixed up. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to trip you up on the days. When I was driving, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a clear way then. When I was driving around, she was the only person I talked to. Okay, okay. dude. Okay. What is that donation? Do you remember what time you started driving around campus that day? 
This is not the last the one The suspect technique. was driving around for over two hours before he picked up the victim, which was used to assert the argument that he was premeditating an abduction. Yeah. He, driving off campus in he was premeditating an abduction. Adu 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 abduction. Adu abduction. If I did, it wasn't that far. He planned this. Same, were you in Orchard Downs? Orchard Downs. Where all of our married student housing is. There's a large Asian community that lives out there. Are you driving around Orchard Downs? I did go to Orchard Downs for a little bit, but there was construction, so I turned back. This was used to assert the argument that not only was the abduction premeditated, but he was specifically targeting a female of Asian ethnicity. Yeah, he so you was. So you were cruising around campus a bit, um, trying to clear your head? wife was up in Wisconsin with her boyfriend. Um, while you were cruising around, you saw Miss Ying Ying. Um, she appeared very distressed. She appeared very abductable. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. her, yeah. I mean, I don't If I recognized her, I would have told the agents that came on Monday, oh, Tuesday, blah, blah. Was, that it was her. Okay, light. Because I knew she was missing. Um, yeah? I picked up an Asian girl. I thought she was about 20. When she said she was distressed, uh, or you said that she looked distressed, what did, what did she say to you when you rolled your window down and talked to her? Um, she said she was late for something. Other than that, did she, she tell you what, what it was? She said she had a at? meeting with her professor. Again, my... My theory is that she didn't get out of the car. Um, I'm just being open with you. My, my theory is um, this guy. Uh, she's in there a little bit longer. He messed the lead up. detective is now using the same technique as the second detective used earlier to gain the initial admittance from the suspect. He doesn't directly accuse the suspect of abduction, but is trying to gain further admittance past what the suspect has already acknowledged, being that he simply picked up and dropped off Yin Ying after she panicked. Um, I'd like you to be more forthcoming with me because again, I need to find where she is. We have 600 Chinese students that have volunteered to look for her. What I can tell you is that Fear we time. will find her. Now, when we find her is up to you. Because you know and we know that she didn't just get out of your car. So we need to know where she is now so that we can move forward from this. But... If you maintain that she just got out of the car and walked away, it's very difficult for us to move forward. Were, were you hoping for um, just kind of like a quick tryst with her or see if, you know, trying to, trying to pick her up? I mean, that would have been nice, but... <gasps> Another rookie mistake. Do, do you have... I'm going to ask you a weird question. And, you know, His phone was on. Fetishes. How would you describe your relationship with your wife? Are you guys into certain things? Do you like porn? Do you like... Um, we're pretty vanilla together. Um, but... Vanilla? Yes, pretty much it. We have some stuff in our apartment. I mean, do you have like certain types of people that you have fantasies about, that you might want to hook up with, you know, not particularly, no. I want to hook up with anime ever, characters. Like, um, you do realize like, everything you tell us, we fact check, regardless. But they don't exist. So, mm -hmm. like stuff like uh, YouTube videos that you've seen okay. regarding Asian women. Do you like videos of Asian women? <laughs> like Korean women? Like K-pop songs and stuff? I mean... Maybe. I like... Okay, so I like all types of women. Okay. And that's, that's the truth. So, I don't have an Asian fetish. But something drew your eye to her. Yeah. Because you, you were cruising all over. Mm -hmm. And 
he was, she was looking for a girl. I mean, there was an e phone stand right behind her. She could have pushed that button and, and got help. And she didn't ask you for help, per se. She asked, she needed to get to, she was late for something. Yeah. And that's, so you offered to give her a ride. You're a smart man. You have a PhD, right? Masters. Masters. Oh, you just got out of the PhD. You're still a smart man, is my point. So you have to understand how technology works. How do you think I knew that she Googled the address to One North? How do you think I knew that? One minute after getting in your car, how do you think I knew that? Mm -hmm. We know that you did. She didn't get out of your car. You need to be honest with us. Help us put this to rest. Help us bring her back to her family. You can do that. You can do that. You can do it right now. I understand if you've had dark thoughts. I understand if you've been, been depressed. I understand if you've been drinking too much at times. I understand if you've had sadistic thoughts, wondered what it would be like to commit an act of violence. I know that temptation is out there. I need to find her. I know she got in your car. You went with her. Where is she? You've been depressed. Your wife just left to go on a vacation with another man. You see her. She gets in, she's vulnerable, let me find her. I think I told you. Okay, so did she get back in your car then? No. Did you get out of the car and follow her? No. Definitely not, I didn't get on my car single time. Well, why not? Was it because of the kind of neighborhood you were in? I don't know anything about that road. So um, did she run away from you? Did she stand there? No, she stood there, looked at her phone, and I drove away. Did you? Were you attracted to her at all? Reasonable amount. I mean, she's a good-looking girl. Did the thought cross your mind? Yeah, the thought crossed my mind, but I probably haven't with anyone. I mean, maybe she's into that. Is my point. And I'm not, I'm not judging you. If she got in your car and she wanted to have, go to another location, you guys have a, have some fun, roll, roll around, have sex, consensual sex. Something happens. You panic. Is that a possibility? You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. So you're telling me you never had sex with her? I never had sex with her. Never penetrated her with your fingers, any of any parts of her body, with no. your penis, no. with your fingers. No. Never had sex. Did you kiss her? No. Liar, liar. He's a liar. Are you afraid? Are you afraid to tell me if you did? Yes, he it, is. It seems like you're. You're trying to think, instead of just answering the question, you're trying to think about three steps forward, well, like where I'm going with it. And I think I've demonstrated enough, I've shared enough with you that you know that I know that you, you didn't drop her off in that, in that neighborhood. You, you know that we can follow her phone. Okay. Mm-hmm. So where did you drop her off at? Where'd you take her, Brent? 
The suspect maintained his innocence and was released without charge, no. but was immediately placed under surveillance at the completion of this interrogation. Four days later, the FBI reached out to his girlfriend, Tara Bullis, who agreed to wear a listening device and attempt to get him to open up about Yin Ying's disappearance and his potential involvement. This arranged strategy turned out to be a total success, <gasps> and Brent Christensen was arrested on June 30th, exactly two weeks after his interrogation. An FBI agent testified that Brent Christensen's girlfriend became a key part of the case when she agreed to record conversations she had with him in the weeks following Ying Ying Zhang's disappearance. A total of nine recordings came from that. At first, he denied guilt and told her everything would be okay. But then on June 29th, after a night of drinking, he described killing Zhang in detail. Investigators say the final recordings were made the day of a memorial walk and concert for the missing Ying Ying Zhang, an event that Christensen actually attended with his then girlfriend. What he didn't know is that girlfriend was wearing an FBI recording device. On the walk home, the two began to talk about the crime. I cut her clothes off and just started doing stuff to her, he said. Earlier in the conversation, he said, she was resilient. I tried to choke her to death, but she didn't. I choked her for what must have been 10 minutes. Then I released her, her breath. I couldn't believe she was still alive. Christensen said he hit Zhang in the head with a bat and stabbed her, and she was still alive, so he decapitated her. Prosecutors say the recording showed that oh. Christensen bragged about killing 12 other people, but they have no other evidence of more victims. Ying Ying is the only person that has produced evidence that leads back to me. Number 13, he said. I've been at this since I was 19. He told his girlfriend he had been wanting to talk to someone about it and he wanted to kill more people. I still want to do it, he said. It's my legacy. And as if this has not been hard enough for Zhang's family, some of them were in the courtroom today. Zhang's father kept his eyes closed during that recording. Christensen was mostly expressionless. His defense team has tried to paint him as a man with mental health and substance abuse issues who does not deserve the death penalty. The trial continues next week. It's a step toward justice for what? Ying Zhang. The man who kidnapped and killed her is guilty. Good evening, I'm Paul Cicchini. And I'm Jennifer Roscoe. A jury took less than two hours to convict Brent Christensen of abducting and killing Zhang and lying to the FBI about it. She was last seen June 9th, 2017, getting into his black Saturn Astra on the U of I campus. Christensen faces either life in prison or the death penalty. Brent Christensen, the convicted killer of Chinese scholar Ying Ying Zhang, will spend the rest of his life in prison because a federal jury couldn't decide if he should be sentenced to die. The judge certainly didn't mince words in his final statements. CBS 2's Tara Molina is live in the newsroom with more on that decision tonight. Tara. Erica and Brad, this is the, this is the same jury that found Christensen guilty of kidnapping and killing Zhang. They couldn't come to a unanimous decision on the death penalty. And the judge certainly didn't mince his words. In his final statements to Christensen, he said, quote, the mercy extended to you by this jury is a testament to their humanity, not your character. Brent Christensen is currently serving his sentence at the Maximum Security Statesville Correctional Center in Illinois. Despite the FBI recordings, he maintains his innocence to this day. The body of Yin Ying Zheng is yet to be recovered. It's kind of creepy that... Uh, he seemed, like, normal, you know? <laughs>